I haven't talked about ships in a hot minute. And you know, mad science has no limits. No rules. No boundaries. The only ones that exist are the ones we break down ourselves. And naturally, there have been plenty of ships and other waterborne craft that have been, um, a little crazy. Just a little, little nonsense. Little, little absurd. And I've done a list of mad science experiments that were also ships. But I figured a part two was in order. Let's talk about five more. Ships that are clearly just mad science experiments. The Vernon C. Bain Correctional Center. That's a, that's a ship, is it? Uh, it's a correctional center, but it's a ship, and it, it, yes. Well, no, actually. Technically, it wouldn't be a ship, as it has no propulsion of its own. It's a barge. A jail barge that is used to hold inmates for the New York City Department of Corrections. <laughs> and already, <laughs> this is the plot to, to, to someone's true crime dystopia novel and, 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 I, and I mean that literally I am convinced that there are multiple novels with that very premise a floating prison and if there isn't I will write it myself because what but yes indeed this is an 800 bed jail barge that is anchored off the Bronx's southern shore across from Rikers Island it was built for 161 million dollars at Avondale Shipyard in Louisiana, along the Mississippi River near New Orleans, and brought to New York in 1992, specifically to reduce an overcrowding issue that Rikers Island was dealing with at the time. The barge was seen as a lower-cost alternative to constructing a new facility, and in that way, it was. It was cheaper to build the barge than it was to buy land and build a building on it. It is actually the third time they've done this. And prison ships as a whole actually date back to at least the 1700s, when King George III, due to, again, a shortage of prison space in London, started utilizing ships to hold prisoners. While the concept is similar, it is important to mention that the Vernon C. Bain was, for one thing, built from the ground up to be a prison ship, and for two, does at least fit to more modern standards in terms of treating prisoners, well, Still as prisoners, but less cruelly than I imagine they would have gotten if they were on a 1700s style ship. In fact, the Vernon C. Bain entered the Guinness Book of World Records in 2014, as it was named by them to be the largest prison barge in operation. Although, she is destined for decommissioning. As of September 2023, she was supposed to be out of service as early as November of 2023, but as far as I'm able to tell as of the making of this video right now, she is still in operation. Don't know what's gonna happen to her after that happens, though I can't imagine she'd be preserved. Maybe resold for the same purposes, or just flat out scrapped. It's hard to say with this kind of thing, but she definitely looks distinctive, and her role is pretty distinctive too, especially in the modern day. The sea-based X-Band Radar, or SBX-1, is a floating, self-propelled, mobile, active, electronically scanned array early warning radar station. Yes! Absolutely! Now that's what we're looking for with some mad science nonsense! And looking at her, she doesn't even look like a ship. I mean, does she move? Is she another barge? Well, no, no she's not. She can move under her own power, hence self-propelled. And she's meant to operate in high winds and heavy seas. Developed as a part of the United States Department of Defense Missile Defense Agency's, or MDA, Ballistic Missile Defense System. Her perplexing appearance can be attributed to the fact that her radar dome, which is large and obvious, is mounted on a fifth generation CS-50 twin-hulled semi-submersible oil platform. So in case you were thinking she looks like she's on an oil platform, that's because she absolutely is. And she spends most of her time based at Adak Island in Alaska, but she's also taken trips down to Pearl Harbor on occasion. Her role is simply that of a very powerful radar system, 
alerting the United States Defense Forces of potential threats so they'll have time to react. Yeah, we still remember what happened on Pearl Harbor when we ignored the radars or didn't know how they worked. We're not playing that game anymore. You're not touching our boats again. I'm not doing it. We're watching you. She's also lovingly referred to by the locals of Oahu as the golf ball. Because, really, you don't know why. I shouldn't have to explain that nickname. It's actually a very obvious one. The radar, just so we're clear, has a range of 2,000 kilometers, or 1,200 miles. Though, interestingly, most of her crew isn't military. A lot of them are civilian contractors. But I would imagine that's because she's not meant to be in a war zone. The SBX-1 can see so far that the idea of putting her in a place where she'd get shot at is absurd. She has no need to be there. The whole point of her is to spot enemies from very, very far away so actual warships can go and deal with the threat. And while she can move on her own, she can't move very fast, with only a taut speed of 9 knots. That's just 10 miles per hour. But still, she serves a very vital purpose, and is still in service as I speak. <laughs> The Have Farm 1. Is that even a ship? It, it's got holes in it. Is it not done? It looks kind of like an oil rig, but with just the frame? Well, this particular, um, ship, which is a word I'm going to use very loosely to describe this particular creation, is the largest semi-submersible structure ever built, and the largest man-made structure to be transported on a heavy lifting vessel. This thing was designed by NSK Ship Design for Norwegian fishing company Nordlax, and its purpose is actually quite a novel one. She is for fish farming. And she was built to actually get around some regulations when it came to restrictions on the fish farming industry over there. There are no rules for seagoing structures or ships, though Half Farm 1 is designed for sustainable fish farming. You may have read a few alarmist articles talking about how we are overfishing and we're gonna drive all the fish to extinction and then we're gonna starve, which seems like a gross exaggeration of what'll probably happen, but I generally do err on the side of conservation when it comes to such things, so any solution that prevents us from using too much of a single resource and therefore running out of said resource, whether it be animals, plants, or what have you, is fine by me, and indeed, this thing is designed to house up to 10,000 tons of sand and while she does have a small crew on board, a lot of the functions will be done from the shore via Ethernet and Wi-Fi systems. She's also fitted with six Rolls-Royce Marine tunnel thrusters for ensuring a sufficient flow of oxygen-rich seawater from the outside of the structure to the fish farming areas. It's all very industrialized, but well thought out. And while power to her is supplied from a shore connection, she does have onboard generators that are available to give her backup electricity for her to continue operations for at least a short time. She's a pretty innovative beast in terms of this particular industry, although there are a few animal rights groups that would argue against this because farming bad, how dare you eat animals, and da 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 listen, look, it, it, it's, it's one of those things. But I would argue that fish farming actually helps wild fish because if you're farming the fish, well, the ones on the farms are the ones that get eaten. You leave the wild fish alone, and salmon are very delicate. They have very specific breeding patterns, and overfishing of them could really upset that practice. If this can effectively farm them instead, that would mean the wild salmon would be allowed to exist peacefully without us really bothering them as much. Either way, it's definitely an interesting idea, though the verdict's still out as to how well it's going to go, as this thing was only put out to the water just a few years ago. The Academic Lomonosov. Did you need me to tell you this is Russian? Because with that name, I thought it was pretty obvious. Also, I'm cheating again, and I know, I know, I've done it three times on this list, because technically this isn't a ship either. This is a non-self-propelled power barge. And from the outside looking in, she may not seem that crazy. She looks like kind of a building on a barge. Eh, that's not too exciting. So what's the deal? Well, you are looking at Russia's first FLOATING NUCLEAR POWER STATION! What? Really? Why? Well, this is for practical reasons, actually. 
The far northern regions of Russia are difficult to get consistent power to, as well as maintain because it's so cold, but the residents would really like power because it is, again, very, very cold. So the logic here is simply, all right guys, what if we made a nuclear power plant, but like made it so we could move it around? Hence the barge. And indeed, that is exactly what she does. She provides power to more rural areas that desperately need the extra energy. Via two KLT-40S nuclear reactors, they're actually derived from icebreaker propulsion reactors. Together, they provide about 300 megawatts. They use low enriched uranium with a fuel cycle of three years. And she can work as a cogeneration plant as well, or a combined heat and power plant, by utilizing the waste heat from the reactors. That heat is collected, and as a result, she can provide up to 60 megawatts of thermal power as well, via clamped pipelines, which is very useful in, again, the bitterly cold far north of Russia. It's one of those things that I gotta admit is a pretty neat idea, though it has undergone criticism, mostly from Greenpeace and the Bologna Foundation, who's like Greenpeace, another environmental group. The Blotter Foundation criticized the idea of a floating nuclear power plant, and Greenpeace criticized it because it may cause harm to a fragile environment that is already under enormous pressure from climate change, referring to it as a nuclear titanic and Chernobyl on ice. Oh, horrific buzzwords. Someone stop the listen. Guys, first of all, the owners of this particular thing Rosatom uh, pointed this out, and I'll concur because they are correct. The PWR reactors they're using in this thing uh, have basically nothing in common with the old RBMK reactors that were used at Chernobyl. And these new modern reactors are designed to shut down automatically without external power and human intervention in case of emergency. The design incorporates all the state-of-the-art safeguards. And I understand that, especially lately, we are kind of inclined not to trust Russia, but in their defense, they haven't had a major accident since Chernobyl, and honestly, it being floating is probably better. They also point out that many militaries, like ours, use nuclear power in ships, and have done so for decades. Our submarines, our new aircraft carriers, they all use nuclear power. This just happens to be a nuclear power plant, and provides the power to the shore. It doesn't transfer radiation to the shore via, it's just, it's just the electricity. If something did go wrong, worst case scenario, the water's freezing up there. They could literally sink it and it would probably be fine because it would cool down almost immediately. I understand a lot of people in the modern day are still very scared of nuclear power and radiation. Oh, scary, but it's really a lot safer than people seem to think it is, especially when modern safety standards are in place. And I definitely think that the academic Lomonosov is a good idea in concept. It's providing electricity to people who desperately need it, who live in a very harsh climate. And remember, nuclear power doesn't actually produce any emissions to the atmosphere. So climate change really isn't a relevant discussion when it comes to this because it doesn't produce any carbon. If you've ever seen a nuclear power plant and see the smoke coming out, that's just steam. It's true, nuclear power does produce nuclear waste, which is bad and we have to deal with that, but it doesn't hurt the atmosphere directly. So really, I, I think the environmental groups are just jumping on it because nuclear scary. Quick, write an article about it. That's, that's, that's where I'm at with the, with the discussion. Uh, interesting idea though, interesting. The Aria. What is that? What even is that? Well, for a while, no one seemed to know. There are a lot of different angles of this particular vessel. And for at least a few years online, back in the early 2000s, no one seemed to have a solid answer as to what in the blue heck this thing is, or was, as the case may be. But through some deep dives, I have finally found a solid answer. Her name was Arya, and she is, well, a ship, but she's an East German ship, built under what was known as Project 415. She was constructed in 1989 at a shipyard in East Germany. Her original purpose, as far as anyone seems to know, is that she was supposed to be some kind of spy ship. Though exactly how she would have carried out this task isn't clear, and it's not really clear how anyone saw anything or even how far along she was. Was she ever finished? I mean, she was obviously launched, but in terms of fitting out, I don't know, it's hard to tell. She doesn't have any windows on her. What the heck is going on here? She was confusing, uh, is really what she was. 
In the 90s, she changed hands, and there were actually plans to turn her into a floating casino instead. Which, okay, that's a shift. But uh, that uh, didn't happen, actually. She was never turned into this. And she would wind up sitting derelict in Turku, which is in Finland, for many years until at least 2009. And it seemed like while she was there, it's when most people outside of the know started getting, well, curious about her because... The heck is that? She just looks so weird and even now I don't have concrete information as to her general purpose or capabilities, whatever they would have been, as she was pretty much just abandoned. And in 2009, she was finally sent to Lithuania to be scrapped, as was her fate, which I think is a bit of a shame, not because I know anything about her, but I, I think that's really why, though. I, I don't know anything about her. Like, someone tell me what she was. What was she supposed to do? Why does she look like that? Where are the windows? Is that a jet engine behind her? Like, there was even one post where someone thought this might be a prototype, a chronoplane that the Soviets were working on before they collapsed. I don't think that's the case. She doesn't really look like it to me. Uh, but, I mean, maybe she wasn't finished. I, I, there's a lot of unknowns with Arya. And I think Arya will remain a little bit mysterious from now until the end of time. But she definitely looks funny. Gotta give her that. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Brian, Jack Carson's Row Videos, Lord Alpha 44, Mark Holding, Murder Jones Doll, A Person 723, Row Hudson 2060, Isaac for 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Hayden DeGrow, Caleb Brainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, The Oklahoma Hot Rail, Liam Wright, Mr. Sleepy, Travis Delinsky, Jared Brussel, Dr. Racer 78, Joshua Long, Hannah Bird, and Track 2024 Productions, Tommy Rossini, and That Guy with a Beard. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.